Check this out. So I was flipping through this here magazine the other day and I saw something that took me down memory lane. I saw this thing, the Neumann KU100 dummy head microphone. This took me down memory lane because I actually got to use one of these when I was in college about a million years ago and it was mind blowing. We used it to record a theatrical production. We put this in front of the stage and when you heard the recordings on headphones afterwards, it's as if you were there. You can hear people walking in front of you in like super 3D stereo. This happened to be filmed in front of a live audience. So you can actually hear people laughing behind you. Not like a crowd, but you can pick out individual voices like behind your head. I had completely forgotten about this type of microphone until I saw this and I thought, man, that'd be cool. It'd be cool to have one of these and just, just play with it. And then I saw the price. You see, 6,502 pounds. That's almost 8,000 bucks. Now, I don't have 8,000 bucks. So I started looking at uh, lower cost options for, for dummy head microphones. This is probably the best one, but there are others. So I thought maybe I can find a cheaper alternative. And uh, even the cheap alternatives are between like 500 and 2,000 bucks. And I, you know, I'm a hobbyist. I'm not gonna use a mic like this nearly enough to justify spending even 500, let alone 2,000 bucks. And then I thought, you know what? I'm pretty handy, I know how to make things. And I decided to set a low budget. So we're not gonna build this for $7,000, $8,000. We're not gonna build it for $700. We're not even gonna build it for $70. I've got about 20 bucks I can throw at a binaural dummy head microphone. And my goal is to try to see how good I can make it. I mean, how hard can it be? All right, all right, welcome to my new studio. It turns out that making a dummy head microphone is actually not that hard. Allow me to introduce you to my friend, uh, Dumkov. Eh, eh? His full name is Dumkov Type 111 because it took me about 11 iterations to get the first sort of version one happening here. The head is made out of styrofoam. Turns out a lot of people buy these for uh, making like wigs and hats and uh, crocheting and other things of that sort. The ears are actually made out of, uh, I thought these were gonna have to get 3D printed out of some sort of silicone rubber or something, or I'd have to make a cast out of my own ear or something. And mercifully, I did not have to do anything like that. These are just rubber ears that you can buy on Amazon. Turns out you can buy them. They're popular with medical students and also with people getting into acupuncture. On the inside of the ear is an Electret condenser capsule. And there's two of them. Obviously, there's one on each side. You've got a pair of uh, XLR cables going uh, into my trusty Zoom H6 recorder. The head actually comes with a nice hole drilled right in the bottom, so I didn't have to do anything there. And uh, this is a converted selfie stick, because if I wanted to do a selfie, I just... I took that and adapted a uh, GoPro style connector here and attached that to the uh, selfie stick, which it turns out is the exact right size of this diameter. So I'm sure everybody wants to hear what the thing sounds like. You need to have headphones or earbuds for this to really work. So make sure you have those on and uh, when you're ready, it will sound like... We are magically outside on a totally different day. Now, if you have headphones on, you should hear me walking around. Uh, the camera should give you some kind of visual reference. If I get close to one ear and talk right into one ear, you should really hear that, that stereo effect. Another fun thing you can do is just take everyday objects and get kind of a stereo effect happening. Take a piece of paper like this. Now just for reference, I'm going to put just the Sony microphones up so you can hear what that sounds like. So this is the sound of my voice through the Sony's internal microphones. And this is the sound of my voice through the lapel mic that I have on right now. And we're back to the binaural mic. Now I gotta be honest with you, I can't believe this microphone works as well as it does. I'm, I'm amazed that it was actually this easy to get a uh, quite a decent sound from something that costs less than 20 bucks.
You know, it was so easy to make that microphone. I thought I would take it on the road and make a film with it. I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I mean, how hard can it be? Those places can go find it really hard. I think I'm going to stick to making things on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, there are a lot of DIY binaural head videos and I'm certainly not the first person to make a video like this. The thing is, I've actually watched many of these videos and even followed their step-by-step -step instructions only to run into all kinds of problems. For example, they didn't work at all. If you take a cable like this and you clip the other end and you take a capsule like this, an electrode condenser capsule and just wire it up, this may or may not work. If your computer's sound card supports the old school analog headsets, then yes, this will work. But if you connect this to an audio interface, chances are that audio interface is not gonna provide any power, which means you're not gonna get any signal at all. The second problem I ran into was that if you use an XLR cable like this, and you clip the other end and you attach a capsule like this, that capsule is gonna work for a few seconds or a few minutes until it dies a horrible crackly death. In almost all cases, the videos make almost no mention of what to do about all of the ground hum and radio frequency interference that's in the air. I'm not sure, maybe they did some noise reduction or other trickery to get the noise levels down, or maybe I live in a particularly noisy neighborhood, but there was a lot of electrical noise in my recordings and I wanted to deal with it without having to use software to reduce the noise levels. Now, what I wanna do with the rest of this video is to make a second microphone from scratch and then talk about the problems and the solutions that I found to those problems. What I've ended up with is a microphone that sounds really good. It picks up very little electrical noise and has actually worked reliably for several weeks now. So I think it's a good microphone. Is my microphone perfect? Certainly not. I think there are ways to make it even better, but it's good enough to feature it in this video without having to use any noise reduction or post-production trickery to make it sound good, okay? Let's get into the problems. Power. Let's talk about it. Electret capsules like this, these are not like dynamic microphones. They need to be powered. Now, most studio microphones run on 48 volt phantom power, and that is way too much power for 
a capsule like this. If you give it 48 volts, you're going to kill this capsule. I know this because I have killed quite a few of these capsules. Here's my little graveyard bag of broken bits. It's actually kind of an insidious problem in that the capsules may work for a little while, even 10 or 15 minutes, but eventually that capsule is gonna die a horrible crackly death. So uh, this capsule was dead before. Wait, wait, I think it's starting to die again. If you open up one of these capsules, here's the open capsule, and here's what's inside. And if you look really closely there, you can see that there's actually a little transistor there. This is not designed to take anywhere near 48 volts, and that's why it dies. Now, if you take a look at the data sheet for a capsule like this, you'll see that the operating voltage is between 1.5 and 10 volts, and the standard or nominal voltage is actually 4.5 volts. So what you really need is something around four and a half, five volts. It doesn't have to be exact, but it needs to be somewhere in this ballpark. 48 volts is not 5 volts, and that's where we have a problem. Now, I happen to be using a Zoom H6, and that recorder actually has options for 48, 24, or even 12 volts of phantom power, which is great, but it's still a little bit too high. I actually tested this and found that the capsule started to die after a while, I think because of over voltage. So what you need to do is divide that voltage down. And the good news is that you can do this with a simple resistor. Depending on your phantom power source and whatever capsules that you're using, you may need to adjust the values of this up or down to bring the voltage arriving at the capsule in line with what you need. But all you need to do is wire one of these in parallel with these leads here, and you should be good. If you take a resistor like this and connect it to your capsule, you're going to have a capsule that works reliably, but you're going to have a lot of RF and ground hum noise problems. For example, if you record in a quiet room and you take a close look at your recordings in RX, you're going to see all kinds of gnarly problems. A lot of noise. At the bottom, you'll hear 50 and 60 hertz hum, and at high frequencies, you'll hear all kinds of RF interference from different kinds of electronics. For example, I saw some really gnarly peaks at exactly one kilohertz intervals, and it turns out this is the actual switching frequency of 4G cellular networks. You can see that here. These low and high frequency hums are irritating, but they're easy enough to remove with RX's brilliant filtering, but I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to see if I could stop the problem before it actually got into my recordings in the first place. So I had several chats with my brother who is an actual electrical engineer, unlike yours truly, and we determined that what's needed is a filtering capacitor something in the one nanofarad to 100 picofarad range. Anything higher than that starts to affect your audio, which we didn't want since we want this to be a clean sounding microphone. So what I did was I broke out a breadboard and started plugging in different combinations of resistors and capacitors and capsules to see if any combination produced a pretty good sound. And eventually I settled on the 6.8K resistor and a 100 picofarad capacitor. Once I knew which combination worked well for me, I wired up the capacitor and resistor in parallel, soldered everything together, and put them so that they're parallel with the capsule, just like the resistor from before. Ultimately, this improved the sound immensely. It didn't solve the problem completely, but it was a huge step forward in the right direction. So with power and RF filtering out of the way, we were able to look at other ways of improving the signal to noise ratio. One problem that immediately jumped out at us was that the second pin, this blue one here, is actually not connected to anything and it's floating. And that's bad because it means this line is gonna pick up noise and send it back into your recorder. The solution to this was simple. All we did was take another one of these resistor and capacitor combinations, wire them up in parallel and use that to connect the second line to ground. This made another big improvement since any noise picked up on the line is eliminated by the receiving device when it flips the polarity of the second pin. The workings of differential signals like in XLR cables is really amazing and there are many good videos about this on YouTube. One of the best ones I've seen is from the CS Guitars channel. So go there and have a look if you don't know how these cables work. Colin does a great job of explaining it all. Okay, so with the voltage dividing and filtering capacitor out of the way, things were starting to sound pretty good, but there was a little bit more optimizing that we wanted to do. See, having an exposed capsule like this and having wires outside of this shield 
is you're, you're inviting noise into your signal. This wire is like an antenna and this shield is doing a, a decent job at protecting these cables from any noise that's coming along. But as long as these are outside of this shield, you're gonna start picking up all kinds of noise. The way to fix that is to put some sort of shield around this whole thing and the capsule. Now, I was trying to figure out ways of maybe milling something or buying a tube in the right diameter that's made out of metal. My brother came along with the idea and said, why don't you just wrap the whole thing in solder braid and call it done? Now, I don't use the word genius often. I took some solder braid like this and I wrapped it all the way around the end of this wire with the exposed ends and the capsule. Now, pro tip, you gotta use electrical tape around your leads to make sure that nothing is shorting. You wanna make sure that your, your, your plus wire, your negative wire and the, and the ground, they're not touching where they're not supposed to. Normally, I would recommend using heat shrink, but I would not recommend that in this case. I say this because heat shrink needs well, heat to make it shrink. Now, normally this isn't a problem, but in my experience on this project, heat seems to damage these capsules. I think some of these ended up getting damaged due to heat from the soldering iron and also from my heat gun. So I would recommend against that. Just use electrician's tape like this and wrap up your capsules and you end up with a nice, neat package like this. You can sort of see the, the copper braid sticking out of the edge here and there's enough protection here that it's not it's not going to go anywhere So there you have it folks, my low cost dummy head microphone. This project has been a bit of a behemoth to produce. I ended up doing a lot of research on binaural recording, building prototypes and making over 70 listening tests to track my progress. This is by no means a perfect microphone and I'm sure there's plenty of room for improvement, but frankly, I'm amazed that you can get this level of performance for so little money. These DIY projects are always fun and educational, but sometimes the results can be a little bit impractical, like my microphone made out of a paper cup, or my famous IKEA plate reverb project. Not true with this mic though. I can actually see myself using this to make a real recording, which is cool. Anyway, if you've made it this far, thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this video and have learned something new. If you did, please like and subscribe and leave comments if you have any questions. If you really like this video, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting this channel in any way that you can comfortably afford. Your support helps me do more projects like this one and really helps keep me motivated. Anyway, thanks again for watching. I hope everyone is staying safe out there and 
I will see you in the next one.